Uh, so uh, welcome everyone. I'm Herschel Nackless, a professor in uh, the government department here and in the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy. Uh, so welcome to this year's Roger Aaron lecture to be given by Professor Rebecca Zitlow. Did I get that right? Um, on anti-slavery constitutionalism and the meaning of freedom. Uh, just by way of background, this lecture series was endowed in 1996 uh, with gifts from the Dartmouth Lawyers Association in honor of Roger Aaron, class of 1964. Uh, a longtime senior partner at uh, Skadden, and uh, like Professor Zitlow, a graduate of Yale Law School. Um, so as many of you know, this lecture series supports lectures on law, justice, ethics, and public policy in our liberal arts curriculum. Uh, and past speakers uh, are kind of like the greatest hits of contemporary thinkers on constitutionalism. Uh, so Anthony Cronman, Owen Fiss, who I believe is a Dartmouth alum, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, Fred Schauer, also I think a Dartmouth alum, uh, Randall Kennedy, Nancy Rosenblum, Jeffrey Rosen, Keith Whittington, and we're very, very fortunate to add to that list today's speaker, uh, Professor Rebecca Zitlow, the Charles W. Fornoff Professor of Law and Values at the University of Toledo College of Law. Uh, she's a graduate of Barnard and Yale Law, and she's widely known uh, for her important scholarship on the Reconstruction Era, on the meaning and history of the 13th and 14th Amendments, on constitutional theory, on constitutional interpretation outside of the courts, which is something that um, more people in law school should really think about. Um, and uh, so, so uh, we're very lucky to have her here today. I should also note that there is a con law professor's listserv that some people in this room might also be on. It is generally full of terrible material, but one of the few consistently smart and interesting posters on this listserv, um, and so I'm delighted to meet her today for that reason as well. Uh, is, is Professor Zitlow. So uh, please join me in welcoming her here today to Dartmouth to talk about this timely and important subject. Thank you so much, Herschel, and, and um, to the Rockefeller Center, to Joanne for helping me uh, with all the details, and uh, to the students that I had a chance to meet with today, and, I, and I'm going to be meeting with some more. Um, it's such a huge, <clears throat> such a huge honor to be here uh, at Dartmouth College. Um, it's especially an honor for me because both my husband and my sister-in-law are Dartmouth grads, and they are here in the audience right now. So I can truly say that it is a small college, but there are those in my family who love it. <laughs> and, and that I've been here many times for various reunions and other events, so it's really pretty special to be able to be here and, and speaking to all of you. And so what I'm going to talk about today is, is history, but it's also about a way of thinking about the Constitution and a way to use the Constitution in political advocacy, which is what the anti-slavery constitutionalists did. So prior to the Civil War, <clears throat> anti-slavery activists debated the best strategy for combating slavery. Abolitionists such as William Lloyd Garrison argued that the best approach was to attack slavery on moral grounds Others argued that the best way to combat slavery was to engage in politics and argue against it on legal terms. And they debated what the US Constitution meant to the institution of slavery. Garrison rejected the Constitution, but many in the political anti-slavery movement embraced it. They argued that the Constitution prohibited slavery, and they are the people we'll be talking about today. On the ground, anti-slavery constitutionalists were supported by the bravery of fugitive slaves and their allies in the Underground Railroad, free blacks who helped fugitive slaves to escape and asserted rights claims of their own, and northern workers in the nascent labor movement who fought slavery as the most extreme version of unfree labor. Anti-slavery constitutionalists developed a theory of rights of a free person based on the promise of liberty, equality, and justice in the United States Constitution. And they engaged in political advocacy to advance their views, forming political parties and running for office. They formed the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, and they elected members of Congress who became leaders during the Reconstruction era. The United States Civil War was a transformational moment in US history. Um, over 500,000 people died. Some people say, uh, his, their, uh, historians have updated this to 600,000 people, which as a percentage of population would be equivalent to two million people in the country today. And they've, of course, died in, 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 the in, <clears throat> in our country, in, in people's backyards. <clears throat> so it was an extremely traumatic event. <clears throat> 
After the war, during the Reconstruction era, Congress changed the Constitution by ending slavery, establishing individual rights, and really creating the Constitution that we all value so much today. They transformed federalism, um, f making the federal government the primary enforcer of individual rights. They transformed the federal government, giving Congress <clears throat> the power to protect individual rights and transform labor law, replacing unfree labor with freedom of contract. Slavery would not have ended without the Civil War, but at the beginning of the war, it was far from clear that the war would end slavery, nor that the end of slavery would transform our constitutional structure and establish constitutional rights. All of this change only happened because of advocates like the anti-slavery constitutionalists. Anti-slavery constitutionalism is an example of political movements engaging in popular constitutionalism, constitutional interpretation outside of the courts when advocating rights claims. This political action influences, influences lawmakers who invoke their rights claims when enacting legislation defining and protecting equality rights. And Herschel mentioned that um, in law school, we mostly only talk about courts and lawsuits. And in fact, we learn uh, in law school that the courts are the primary protectors of minority rights, and that's where people need to go to assert their rights claims. But that's simply not an accurate uh, description of what has happened throughout our, throughout our history. Uh, the mo best advances in rights have not happened in the courts, but they have happened outside the courts. But often with people um, uh, asserting legal arguments, arguments in constitutional terms based on fundamental values. And that's, uh, and the, and that's what the anti-slavery constitutionalists did. So just a little bit of background. The original U.S. Constitution, um, in, of course, was established in 1787. Uh, the year before, in the Constitutional Convention, representative of states attended and their main concern was the need for a stronger central government than under the original Articles of Confederation. Individual states had their own interests and concerns. Foremost among those concerns for some states was protecting the institution of slavery. Many decisions made when defining the structure of the United States government in the U.S. Constitution were connected to protecting slavery. Implicit protections include our system of federalism, under which the federal government has limited power, though supreme power, and states have the general police powers and the reserve powers, including the power at the time to legalize slavery. The structure of Congress. The House of Representatives, of course, has proportional representation, but in the Senate, as we all know and, and like, kind of like in New Hampshire, right, the st all states, no matter how small, get two senators and this benefited smaller population states, many of which were slave states. Um, the Electoral College did the same because the size of the Electoral College is based on the size of the um, representation in Congress. And so again, slave states were overrepresented. There were also direct protections of slavery in the original Constitution, including the so-called three-fifths clause, which said that for the purposes of proportional representation, um, slaves would be counted as three-fifths of other persons. The fugitive slave clause, which referred to persons held to service or labor, and said that slaves, uh, that states had to assist uh, people from other states coming to, um, uh, to uh, bring them back if they had escaped and the prohibition on banning the importation of slaves uh, until 19, 1808. This prof actually referred to such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit. Now I want to point out something. You notice that none of these um, uh, clauses actually use the word slave. Fugitive slaves are, are referred to persons held to service or labor. Three-fifths clause refers to other persons. In fact, the word slave was not uh, in the original Constitution. It was not mentioned in the Constitution until the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. And this was a point that the anti-slavery constitutionalists uh, made when they argued that, the slave, that, that these provisions were not actually intended to protect slavery. <clears throat> 
Now, as for the rights, the original Bill of Rights, of course, came about um, a couple, two years after the original Constitution. Um, they, uh, uh, under the original theory of Madison and Hamilton, uh, the original Constitution avoided listing many individual rights. There were a couple, like the right to contract and the right of habeas corpus. But generally, but they were concerned that listing rights would be precluded and recognition of other rights. But the Bill of Rights came about as a result of the Anti-Federalists who worried about the power of the new federal government. Many were from slave states worried that the federal government would use its power to end or limit slavery. So the Bill of Rights includes the First Amendment freedom of speech, Fifth Amendment due process, criminal justice amendments, and the Supreme Court held in a case of Barron versus Baltimore that these were only enforceable against the federal government and not against the state government. Since people rarely interacted with the federal government, courts rarely enforced ind individual rights. Congress did not enact any measures protecting individual rights either, in part because until, until Reconstruction, it lacked the power to do so. Ironically, the federal government turned out to be not much of a threat to slavery. Four of our first five presidents were from Virginia, the largest and most influential slave, slave state. Congress was mostly controlled by the Southern pro-slavery interests. Um, which enacted Fugitive Slave Acts of 1793 and 1850. Both laws lacked procedural protections for those accused of being fugitive slaves, and free blacks were thus in constant danger. Slave catchers could falsely claim that they were slaves and that they had few legal remedies to resist. The anti-slavery movement in our country dates back to the before the U.S. Revolutionary War. Around the Revolutionary War, most of the northern states abolished slavery, and many opponents of slavery thought it would die out. But the invention of the cotton gin led to the expansion of slavery in the U.S., and the anti-slavery movement responded. In 1831, William Lord Garrison founded his anti-slavery publication, The Liberator, and in 1833, Garrison and his allies founded the American Anti-Slavery Society. Abolitionists such as William Lord Garrison argued that slavery should be abolished because it was immoral and inhumane, but said that the Constitution uh, would be no help at all because it was a covenant with, oops, I'm sorry, there we go, a covenant with death and an agreement, with, uh, an agreement in hell, and that anyone who engaged in politics was complicit with slavery and, the, and morally tainted, and they should not run for office, or engage in any political action. Other opponents of slavery thought it necessary to engage in political action. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they, in 1840, they formed the Liberty Party, a radical anti-slavery political party. In 1848, they formed the Free Soil Party, a more moderate party that sought alliances with northern workers and southern poor whites. And in 1856, Members of the Free Soil Party joined with former Whigs and disillusioned Democrats after the Kansas-Nebraska Act to form the new Republican Party, the party of Abraham Lincoln. Anti-slavery oops, there we go. Many leaders of the political anti-slavery movement advocated a doctrine of anti-slavery constitutionalism. Among them was Salmon Chase, a New Hampshire native and Dartmouth class of 1826. And I happen to have here a little bobblehead doll. See, I brought props. <laughs> Salmon Chase um, was really a hero of, of the anti-slavery constitutionalism. After he graduated from Dartmouth, he moved to Ohio, where he spent the rest of his life. He was governor of Ohio and senator. He was appointed secretary of the treasury and then uh, to the Supreme Court by President Abraham Lincoln. And he was a member of the Liberty, Free Soil, and Republican parties. A well-respected lawyer, Salmon Chase, wrote the party platforms of all of those parties. Other anti-slavery, so that's him, you know, in the lower left, right-hand corner, and right here, of course. Um, other anti-slavery constitutionalists include Joel Tiffany, a lawyer and journalist from Oberlin, Ohio, Theodore Dwight Weld, who's in, in, up in the upper right corner there, an organizer and recruiter for the Anti-American uh, Slavery Society, who um, was active at times in this, um, in this area in Vermont and New Hampshire. <clears throat> 
William Goodell, who wrote um, a treatise that was uh, laid out the radical position of the radical Republicans. Lysander Spooner, a journalist from Boston, Massachusetts, and the legendary abolitionist and former slave Frederick Douglass, who, who Douglass originally was in the camp of, of Garrison, um, finding that the Constitution was a document in hell. But when he changed his mind and decided, no, that actually the Constitution was anti-slavery in the mid-1850s, it caused a huge sensation among uh, the anti-slavery activists and also uh, added significantly to the legitimacy of these arguments. These activists argued that slavery was not only immoral but also unconstitutional, that violated fundamental human rights protected by the Constitution, they articulated broad theories of constitutional rights which were violated by the institution of slavery. And they got these rights from, um, uh, so the three broad, actually four broad theories. Uh, the first, um, the theory of natural rights. They, the, um, this is a theory of rights articulated by the philosopher John Locke, expressed in the Declaration of Independence, which states that all men are possessed of the same natural rights, among them life, liberty, and property. And they argued that the, pre, that the preamble to the U.S. Constitution incorporated the Declaration of Independence when it said, we the people established this Constitution to secure the blessings of liberty. They argued that slavery was contrary to the law of nature, that the state of nature was freedom, and that the, any laws recognizing slavery were suspect, if not unconstitutional. The second theory was based in structural protections in the Constitution, including the Article IV Guarantee Clause, which obligates the United States to guarantee to each state a Republican form of government. They claimed that the Guarantee Clause protected individuals from government oppression. Anti-slavery constitutionalists argued that a Republican form of government could not authorize slavery. Slave states were governed by a tyrannical minority, since slaves were not represented in the government. Therefore, they violated the guarantee clause, which Tiffany called a bulwark of liberty. And of course, the strength of this argument, at least uh, in their view, is reflected in the fact that they eventually called their party the, Re the Republican Party. Um, they also referred to the Article Four Privileges and Immunities Clause, which entitles citizens of each state to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states under the Privileges and Immunities Clause, they argued, free states could recognize their free black residents as, as citizens, and southern states were bound to respect their free status. Their third theory, third sort of general uh, amount of theories, pointed to uh, <clears throat> protections for individual rights in the Constitution, including the right to habeas corpus, that is the right not to be seized illegally by the government, and the right to due process of law, which prohibits the government from depriving people of life, liberty, or property. Salmon Chase was the most prominent proponent of this theory. He claimed that the institution of slavery deprived slaves of due process of law. As his friend and Liberty Party stalwart James Burney asked rhetorically, by what due process of law is it that two million of persons are deprived every year of the millions of dollars produced by their labor? Oh, there it is, yeah. Finally, some anti-slavery constitutionalists argued that the Constitution prohibited castes and distinctions based on race. They, are, they pointed out that the text of the Constitution did not refer to uh, race. Um, it did not, was not limited only to white people. It only referred to people. And they argued that, therefore, it applied to all people. They also pointed to the provisions of the original Constitution, which prohibits titles of nobility, and insisted that in the words of William Goodell, the spirit of the Constitution is the spirit of human equality, directly and specifically hostile to the spirit of caste. Some anti-slavery constitutionalists raised their arguments in court cases. For example, Sam and Chase argued unsuccessfully before the United States Supreme Court that the Fugitive Slave Act was unconstitutional, in part because it violated the Due Process Clause. But mostly anti-slavery constitutionalists made these arguments in the political process. They insisted that Congress had not only the power, but the constitutional duty to abolish slavery. 
Now, I want to take a minute to talk a little bit about constitutional theory because you must be asking yourselves, how could they possibly have, or you might be asking yourselves, how could they possibly have made these arguments given what you told us, me, at the beginning of the lecture, that there are all these compromises made to protect slavery and all these provisions in the Constitution to protect slavery. And that is exactly uh, the point that Garrison made and his allies. They pointed to the framers' intent and they, um, and they had, uh, in the mid-1830s, Madison's notes from the Constitutional Convention were released after he died, and in that he talked about the compromises between the slave states and the free states. So Garrison, the Garrisonian said, obviously this Constitution is uh, a compromise in hell. It is, an, it is a pro-slavery document. It's all about protecting slavery. But the anti-slavery Constitution, and, and, so, and, and in a... In a in essence, the um, Garrisonians were originalists, right? They were looking at the original intent of the framers, the original meaning as understood at the time that persons in the Fugitive Slave Act was intended to mean slaves, for example. Um, but the, the response of the anti-slavery constitutionalists was to uh, raise a textual, textualist argument that they could, should look at the text and not go beyond the text of the Constitution in interpreting what it meant. And I mentioned that it didn't have, the Constitution did not mention slavery. The Fugitive Slave Clause did not mention slavery. They argued it applied actually to indentured, white indentured servants and not to slaves. Um, and that the promise of rights are there in the Constitution, right? Due process of law, it's not limited to one person or another, another person. And they insisted that ambiguity should be resolved in favor of freedom. Now, anti-slavery constitutionalists developed theories of rights that were denied to free blacks and slaves based on these constitutional provisions that I've just showed you. For example, one of the major sources of rights that they talked about was the idea of citizenship. They argued that states had the power to recognize free blacks as citizens entitled to the rights of citizens. They claimed that free blacks were entitled to the protection of the government in, in return for their allegiance to the government. This became a particularly compelling argument at the end of the Civil War in which thousands of freed slaves had sacrificed their lives for the cause of the Union. So what were the rights of citizenship? Principle among them were, was the right to travel, the right, freedom of mobility which was obviously denied to slaves who were not allowed to leave their masters, except under very uh, specific circumstances. They had really no freedom of all, including freedom of movement. But it was also true that some northern states had enacted laws barring free blacks from entering the state, and anti-slavery constitutionalists argued that those laws were an unconstitutional infringement on the right to travel. They also argued that the right to contract and access to courts uh, were rights of citizenship. At the time, these were considered standard civil rights, and they argued that those rights adhered to citizenship. Some articulated an even broader vision of citizenship rights, that they included all natural rights and fundamental humus, human rights. Now, most activists limited these claims to the status of free blacks, but at least one major advocate, Joel Tiffany, claimed that slaves were also citizens if they were born in the United States. Free black activists in the North also promoted the doctrine of birthright citizenship. Since citizenship carried considerable rights and benefits, this was a very strong claim. Due process of law, anti-slavery activists argued that the right to due process included, as I mentioned before, the right not to be enslaved, but also the right to be entitled to the opportunity to prove that you were not a slave if accused of being so. Northern state legislatures embraced these claims and enacted personal liberty laws that entitled persons accused of being slaves to a fair hearing, enforcing their rights to due process. And equal protection of the law. Anti-slavery activists argued that free blacks were entitled to the equal protection of the law. They pointed out that the U.S. Constitution did not differentiate based on race and claimed that laws that discriminated based on race offended the Constitution's overall principles of equality. Many of them fought to overturn northern laws that restricted the rights of free blacks based on their race. And finally, the right to free labor. The right to free labor was, at the very least, the right not to be enslaved, but it was also the right to be free of involuntary servitude. During the 19th century, uh, labor law was transformed from unfree labor to freedom of contract. Now, of course, U.S. chattel slavery was sui generis, 
um, race-based, supported by the doctrine of white supremacy and racial subordination. Slaves were treated like property with no human rights, separated from family members, could be beaten, even murdered, without anyone suffering a penalty. But slaves were also exploited workers, and slaves were not the only unfree laborers in antebellum America. With the doctrine of master-servant based in the feudal system government governed employment and labor law. Thousands of immigrants came to the United States as indentured servants or apprentices bound to masters. And unlike slaves, indentured servants were not treated as subhuman, but they did share some experience with slaves. Like slaves, indentured servants and apprentices could not leave their masters, and in many states they faced criminal sanctions if they tried. Thus, they lacked mobility and other basic legal rights. Other early industrialization produced a new class of workers, industrial workers. These workers worked long hours under horrible conditions for long wages, and some called themselves wage slaves. Some identified with chattel slaves in the South, and some joined and supported the anti-slavery movement. With the recognition of common interests that slavery brings down the condition of all workers, this was the position of the Free Soil Party and the, then the Republican Party. And the right to free labor was central to their ideology. And that picture there is a picture of um, uh, uh, factory workers at the Lowell Mills um, who were very uh, um, strong uh, supporters of the anti-slavery movement. They signed petitions by the hundreds. And they also argued that they themselves um, were wage slaves because of the way they were treated in the factories. All right, so what happened to all these theories? Well, they didn't succeed in the courts, as I mentioned. The Supreme Court rejected the arguments of the anti-slavery constitutionalists in the infamous Dred Scott decision, in which the court held that a person of African descent could not be a citizen, and that slaveholders had a constitutional right to own slaves. Um, but the anti-slavery constitutionalists condemned the court's ruling and continued to articulate their constitutional claims. They called the ruling a political decision and that was not based in principle. And Frederick Douglass, for example, called the decision a most scandalous and devilish perversion of the Constitution. These activists had little faith in the federal courts. Even before Dred Scott, the US Supreme Court had issued important pro-slavery rulings, including the case of Prigg versus Pennsylvania, upholding the constitutionality of the 1793 Fugitive Slave Act, even though it had no con congressional enforcement provision, and holding that slaveholders had a constitutional right, property right in their slaves. Moreover, the lower federal courts were actively involved in enforcing the federal Fugitive Slave Acts after the 19, 1850 Fugitive Slave Act authorized the appointment of federal marshals to enforce it. Instead, they were part of a political movement to enforce the Constitution through the political process. Articulating their claims in constitutional terms gave them added weight and value. Then, as now, people revered the Constitution, but in those times, people did not view the courts as the supreme interpreters of the laws that we do today. They asserted the authority of the people themselves to interpret the Constitution and at times to enforce it, with personal liberty laws authorizing the arrest of slave catchers for kidnapping and providing procedural protections for those accused of being fugitive slaves, with and through civil disobedience, including, of course, the Underground Railroad, and mass rallies protest, protesting the kidnapping of people accused of being fugitive slaves. During the Reconstruction era, the nation amended our Constitution to enshrine popular constitutionalism into law. But the catalyst for all of this was another constitutional actor, a group of constitutional actors, uh, and arguably the ultimate anti-slavery constitutionists, fugitive slaves. Fugitive slaves <clears throat> asserted their own rights claims, defying all odds and certain punishment, if not death, if they were captured. Fugitive slaves escaped to northern states and into Canada where they could live a free life. Some sued in courts for their freedom, and surprisingly, some won, but mostly fugitive slaves had to hide from slave catchers under constant threat of capture. 
Most of the fugitive slaves were illiterate and unwilling or unable to speak for themselves, but some escaped slaves formed alliances with anti-slavery activists, and they asserted their own rights claims. Said escaped slave William Kraft, having heard the words of the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, they, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, we could not understand by what right we were held as chattels. Said Peter Randolph, all they need is, all that we need is first freedom, thus encouragement and a fair award, reward for our labor and a suitable opportunity to improve ourselves. An escaped Jerry, slave Jerry summed it up when he said, are not all men born free and equal? How is it then that I must wear these chains? The fugitive slaves raised constitutional issues that exacerbated, exacerbated tensions between free and slave states, including um, interstate comedy, the relationship between the states, the full faith and, and credit and fugitive slave clauses, to what extent did Article 4 require states to recognize the legal status of people who came from other states. Some Northern officials argued that enslaved people were free when they entered a free state. Southern officials, of course, argued the opposite, that an enslaved person remained a slave wherever he traveled. And, um, and of course, that was the, the, that's what the federal law said. Fugitive slaves, however, concreti concretized disputes over citizenship rights that the anti-slavery constitutionalists had raised, and they sparked popular resistance to the institution of slavery free, by free blacks and their white allies. Participants in the Underground Railroad helped fugitives to escape to slave, slavery <clears throat> safety. Slave catchers attempting to recover fugitive slaves were met with resistance. For example, 80 res residents of Oberlin, Ohio, banded together to rescue a man who had been kidnapped and accused of being a fugitive slave. That's the picture of them there. In other communities, masses of people stormed courthouses in which the fate of accused fugitives were being determined. In northern cities like Detroit, Chicago, and Philadelphia, they participated in mass rallies, which often overwhelmed the authorities' capacity to control them, so that it was very hard for, fugitive, for slave catchers to um, capture slaves once they reached those large cities. According to historian R.J.M. Blaquette, these black crowds were the foot soldiers without whom resistance would have been muted, if not impossible. As a result of this activism, tensions mounted between people in northern states who wanted to protect fugitive slaves and those in southern states who demanded their return. Disputes over fugitive slaves was one of the primary catalysts that led to the Civil War, and the Civil War made ending slavery impossible, uh, possible. Though it began as a fringe movement, anti-slavery constitutionalism increased its influence in the years leading up to the Civil War. In the courts, some state courts adopted anti-slavery constitutionalist principles, most notably in the case of, of Booth versus Edelman. The Wisconsin Supreme Court held that the 1850 F Fugitive Slave Act was unconstitutional. In that case, members of the Wisconsin Supreme Court asserted their own authority to interpret the Constitution differently from the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court, of course, disagreed, <laughs> um, and in a pay-in to federal authority and judicial supremacy uh, overturned the Wisconsin court. But in the political branches, the Republican Party embraced some principles of anti-slavery constitutionalism. For example, the Republican Party platform uh, declared that the D D Due Process Clause prohibited slavery in the U.S. territories. This was a moderate position compared to the other anti-slavery constitutionalist arguments. But prominent members of that party articulated the stronger positions as well as they ran for office and won, including the driving force behind the 13th Amendment and subject of my recent book, <laughs> um, John, uh, James Ashley, John Bingham, the principal author of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, and Thaddeus Stevens, a radical anti-slavery member of Congress and, uh, I'm from Pennsylvania and also Dartmouth grad, class of 1814. These men played a prominent role in constitutionalizing the claims of anti-slavery constitutionalists. Throughout the Civil War, they argued that the war should bring about the end of slavery. <clears throat> 
Their arguments were reinforced by the sacrifices of the freed slaves who joined the Union Army and fought bravely on the front lines. After the war, those freed slaves became politically active, forming groups calling for citizenship rights, including the right to vote. At the end of the war, the Reconstruction Congress enacted the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery and involuntary servitude. Now, I know you're asked, thinking to yourself, if slavery was already unconstitutional, why did they have to amend the Constitution? Well, they had, and, they, and the people such as Ashley had to answer this question. And what Ashley said was, um, and he was the 13th Amendment sponsor in the House of Representatives, he explained that court decisions like Dred Scott wrongly interpreting the Constitution made it necessary to amend it. Enforcing the 13th Amendment, Congress acted to enshrine the vision of the anti-slavery constitutionalists into law. With the 1866 Civil Rights Act, which declared all persons born in the United States to be, uh, to be citizens, and, and, that all, and, that <clears throat> and that all persons within the jurisdiction of the United States shall have the same right in every state and territory to make and enforce contracts, to sue, be parties, give evidence, and to the full and equal benefit of the laws of proceedings for the security of persons and property as enjoyed by white citizens. The 1867 Anti-Peonage Act enforced the rights of free labor, banning not only involuntary servitude, but also voluntary servitude, coercive practices by employers regardless of the terms of their initial employment contract. And the 14th Amendment made rights enforceable against state governments. The 15th Amendment barred discrimination based on race and voting rights. I want to pay a little more attention now to the 14th Amendment in part because it is the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment this year, and also because you can see most clearly here how, where the um, theories of the anti-slavery constitutionalists were constitutionalized. So the 14th Amendment starts out with the citizenship clause that says all persons born or naturalized in the, in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the states wherein they, they reside. This overturned the ruling of Dred Scott and made it very clear and constitutionalized the broader theories of the more radical anti-slavery constitutionalists that every single person who is born in the United States is now a citizen. Um, the Privileges or Immunities Clause recognized the rights of citizenship advocated by the anti-slavery constitutionalists and uh, made it uh, unconstitutional for the states to violate them. The Due Press Process Clause, also a mainstay of anti-slavery constitutionalism, the 14th Amendment made it enforceable against state governments, and the Equal Protection Clause constitutionalized the broadest claims against race discrimination and discrimination based on other immutable characteristics. Notably, all of the Reconstruction measures give Congress, c contain clauses giving Congress the power to enact appropriate measures to enforce it. as does every other amendment in the U.S. Constitution which expands individual rights. This imposes an obligation on the United States Congress to protect those rights and on we the people to pressure them to do so. Since, since then, political activists have often engaged in popular constitutionalism to advocate for the government to protect their rights from labor activists who invoked the 13th Amendment as they fought for the right to organize into unions during the New Deal era, to civil rights activists uh, such as Martin Luther King, who with his followers invoked the Declaration of Independence and demanded that Congress fulfill the promise of the Reconstruction Amendment in the 1960s. Supporters of these rights movements brought lawsuits to enforce constitutional rights, but they also engaged in political action. They had learned that something special happens when legislatures act to protect those rights and when the people themselves assert those rights. The national community opens up to include outsiders, but this will never happen unless supporters of civil rights and other rights engage in political action. All of these movements invo invoke the Constitution or constitutional values, which forms a strong moral core as Professor Mari Matsuda once said, the Constitution is not mine as an Asian woman, but I can make it my own 
The anti-slavery constitutionalists changed the Constitution to end slavery and include freed slaves as members of the national community, and that is their greatest legacy. Thank you. And I'd be very happy to answer questions or for you guys to engage in a discussion. Anybody, questions, comments? Yes, uh, she has a microphone for you. The, we're recording. Why do you think uh, the legal challenges were unsuccessful prior, prior to the Civil War? Was it because they, they were legally deficient, logically deficient, or was it just that racism overwhelmed the legal arguments? Well, I think that uh, actually it's surprising how many legal challenges really won. So uh, uh, Lee Vanderveld who's a scholar of the 13th Amendment, the Reconstruction Congress, has written this great book called uh, Freedom, Redemption Songs about uh, slaves who sued for their freedom, making the same kind of arguments that Dred Scott made, that he um, uh, became free when he went into a free state and a free territory, and they won. Um, but then when it got to the Supreme Court, uh, you know, the Supreme Court ruled the other way. So one answer is some people did actually did win cases. But in terms of the cases that I'm talking, the constitutional claims, I think it was because um, you know, uh, the, the courts were interpreting the Constitution consistent with the, uh, the, you know, the intent of the framers, Madison's notes had come out, and there was kind of a consensus that, um, that, that the Constitution was pro-slavery. Also, you gotta think about this um, fact that the Fugitive Slave Act was there and especially the second one, the 1851, was there as a kind of compromise to try to hold the country together. So if, um, the, if, the, if the, the northern states were refusing to cooperate with returning fugitive slaves, if the court finds that the Fugitive Slave Act is unconstitutional, then what's gonna happen, you know, what's gonna happen next? And then with the Dred Scott decision, they really thought, okay, we're resolving this problem for once and for all. The opposite, of course, was true. It was only three years later that we were, went to the Civil War, which tells you something about what court, how, how good courts are at actually resolving you know, major uh, uh, debates like that. Yes? How far do you think like, the moral argument that anti-slavery uh, advocates use, how, how did it extend into African Americans having so, sort of a uh, sort of economic right to sort of the same job, or was it more limited to just them not being slaves? Like, what, what, what do they believe? How far could did that extend? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's something that I've actually worked on quite a bit, because that's a 13th Amendment. Um, um, so, one thing that everybody was clear about, sort of at all ends of the spectrum, um, and, uh, was that, the, that freed slaves had a right to free labor. Uh, now, what did that mean, is, is your question, right? Does that mean just that you don't have to you know, uh, be bound to your master and, and work without pay? Or does that mean that you have a right to a decent job for a decent pay? Um, and, uh, and to be treated un, uh, without undue coercion. The latter theory is the theory that I have argued that, that uh, many members of the Reconstruction Congress had. I think it's, it's reflected in the 1866 Civil Rights Act, which was actually um, uh, prompted by attempts of the uh, southern, slaves, uh, southern states to impose indentured servitude on the freed slaves to require them to enter into year-long contracts with the master and which they couldn't get out of and basically you know replacing slavery with involuntary servitude and um, and 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 that's what the, the 66 Civil Rights Act was aimed at that you couldn't do that in, in a way that discriminated based on race it didn't go it didn't go far enough and it wasn't adequately enforced so that's is what ended up happening in the south after the end of reconstruction but 
Um, the Anti-Peonage Act, you know, that says that even if you're talked into entering into this, you know, a bad contract by your employer, you if it's unduly, if it's an, if it amounts to involuntary servitude, it's um, uh, it's illegal, um, and that's that's pretty that's pretty going pretty far, I think, when you're saying that even if you think you're entering into a contract voluntarily, if it turns out, um, you know, this, that that you're being uh, uh, exploited by your employer and undue coercion, uh, you can get out of it because of the anti peonage Act prohibits it. So the, the, que the answer to your question is um, it's not entirely clear, but I think that it is broader. I think a strong argument can be made that it's broader than just, it certainly was broader than just ending slavery. Um, and, and that's what the 14th Amendment was all about. That's what the 13th Amendment was all about. 13th Amendment, they thought when they abolished slavery, all those, all those rights um, that we're talking about, many of the, uh, the supporters of the 13th Amendment thought as soon as uh, slaves became free, then they were, they were entitled to those rights, right? It wasn't, freedom wasn't just about not being enslaved anymore. It was about having these fundamental rights. Yes? Whether the Supreme Court has the ability to uh, promote social change mm -hmm. by, um, like, through their rulings, uh, if Dred Scott had gone a different way, if uh, they had ruled instead that Dred Scott did have uh, the right as a citizen of the United States um, or to be a citizen of the United States, do you think that would have avoided uh, the Civil War? Or do you think that would have just uh, flared tensions more? Um, you know, looking back, what what do you think would have would it have changed anything? Well, um, <laughs> there was no chance that the that the Supreme Court was going to rule the other way. Like I told you, in 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 uh, Prigg versus Pennsylvania, they'd already found that slave owners had uh, slave um, had a property right in their slaves. But actually, what one of the worst things that Dred Scott did was to strike down to go even farther. Um, then way farther than necessary for the ruling of the case and to strike down the um, Missouri Compromise. Um, the Missouri Compromise really had already been overturned by the... And the Missouri Compromise, of course, was ab above a north of a certain line would be free, south of a certain line would be would be slave states. The, the Congress had already uh, sort of gotten rid of that with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, but... What the court said was that Congress doesn't have any power to legislate at all to abolish slavery. And when the court does that, that means there's no political outlet left. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing Congress can do. All this activism is going to be, uh, it really, what's left? Violence, you know, that's what happens. If, if so, it's 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 impossible to imagine them ruling the other way. But if they had, yeah, then the southern states would have seceded, which is what they ended up doing anyway. But a few years later, yes, hi, hi. Um, there's kind of this weird conversation happening around uh, right now with regards to the Thirteenth Amendment, kind of being interpreted as, you know, the only thing necessary to convict a freed or sorry, to um, enslave a freed man is to convict him of a crime. Mm -hmm. With our conviction rates specifically affecting black males in mm -hmm. our country at an increasing rate, that kind of strange interpretation doesn't seem so strange to me anymore. Mm. I'm really interested in what your, uh, just kind of what your thoughts are on that idea mm -hmm. and kind of where you think we're going with regards to kind of Fixing this, is it something that should be considered? Should rewriting, you know, or amending the 13th Amendment be something we should be considering or even discussing? What are your thoughts on that? So, um, interestingly enough, my guy, James Ashley, when he first, uh, first introduced the 13th Amendment, it didn't include the exception for persons duly punished, uh, duly convicted of a crime. Um, but he was soon convinced that if that's what the amendment said, then no one, who, the criminals who were convicted of crimes couldn't be put into jail. So that's really what the meaning of that exception is. The exception is not supposed to allow the enslavement or the treatment of prisoners like slaves. And you're right. I think there's a popular understanding that that exception uh, uh, 
does allow those things to take place. I don't think that's true. There, uh, there are some really great scholars doing work on this exact issue right now. Um, Jim Pope, who's a good friend of mine and one of the best 13th Amendment scholars, is working on an article on this right now. And he's found a lot of evidence that, um, that it's not surprising that uh, the, f the framers of the 13th Amendment did not think it would be OK for southern states to simply convict people of vagrancy and then, you know, and then treat them like slaves. And that they knew that that was the kind of thing that southern states would do, because that's what they did with the black codes. Right? That's exactly what they had done. And so um, a measure did pass in the House of Representatives holding that it would be illegal to enslave a person as a, a conviction of a crime. It never did get through the Senate. I think there was just so much other things going on. Um, uh, but uh, there, I think more work needs to be done on this. And I think it's wrong to just concede that. The other point is, well, I'll make two more points about that. <laughs> because yes, always, every single time I give a talk, someone asks about this. And it is a really important issue. One is that um, even if it was OK to treat someone like a slave as a pr punishment as a crime, and I'm just never willing to conceive that, but even if it was, the way that prisoners are treated um, and, and forced to work for nothing it is not uh, termed as punishment, right? It's always uh, you know, a program to train them to learn life skills or to pay back their expenses. You know? And it's not, it's not framed as punishment for a crime. So I also think that's a problem. And um, the badges and incidents of slavery. So 13th Amendment prohibits the badges or incidents of slavery. And uh, it's, you're absolutely right. I mean, it goes all the, all the way back to slavery. And there's a great book, a very depressing as, as heck book, <laughs> called Slavery by Another Name by Douglas Blackman that, that shows how sort of immediately after Reconstruction was over, the uh, southern states started engaging this practice of just arresting black men who were walking you know, on the highway you know, uh, who weren't actually at work, convicting them of vagrancy, and then sending them to prison camps where they worked in the mines, they worked in the steel mills. You know, and that this took place all the way through um, the, at least until the um, late 1930s in, 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 in the South. Um, so, uh, but I, I don't think that's because the 13th Amendment allows it. I think it's because the federal government wasn't, wasn't willing to enforce the 13th Amendment. You know, that's what happened. There was, federal government wasn't interested in, in enforcing all these provisions uh, during the Jim Crow era until, you know, we started getting the civil rights movement in the 1930s and the 1940s, and then, then they, the, so, you know, the federal government starts getting involved again. <laughs> yes? Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about that enforcement a little bit. I yeah. recently read a book by Mary Dudziak called Cold War Civil Rights. Perhaps you're familiar with it. Yes. But she makes the claim, and I'm grossly oversimplifying in that book, that um, Congress worked to pass civil rights laws without really the intent of enforcing them in order to, you know, create an image of the United States as a, you know, viable and progressive democracy. I'm wondering if uh, there was maybe some of those, you know, reformist intentions here where people said one thing while really, you know, trying to diffuse tension and um, not really having the intent of, you know, carrying out social change. Well... Do you want me to talk about in the 1950s or in or the, the um, in the re in the Reconstruction era? No, in the were... Reconstruction era, they absolutely wanted to. I mean, these guys were true believers. You know, they really, really wanted to. to and, and you have to remember that first of all, they were angry. They were angry at the way at at the Southern states, at the Confederates. They just fought a four-year war against them, and they wanted to get back at them. But it's also true. It, this really is important that a lot of the um, that the Union probably wouldn't have won if it wasn't for the fighting, the the willingness of freed slaves to fight, fight for, uh, for the Union side. So they really felt like they had. Uh, a debt to pay to these former slaves that had that were loyal to the government, right? And so uh, they really, I, it was not just a sop to them. They they really were believers, you know. They were they were radicals. I mean, they really they were known as radicals, and and they really were. And Thad Stevens, man, you know, if you saw the movie Lincoln, you know, you know, I mean, he was also you know a very insistent on social equality and, and anti discrimination. Um, in uh, desegregation type stuff, you know. So yeah, these guys, they were really believers. And uh, 
you know, what happened after that? Well, no, they backed off. So what, the Republican Party becomes more of a, it becomes more interested in developing the West, right? More interested in promoting the national economy and less interested, and, and everyone's tired of fighting. So, uh, yeah. Do you want me to talk about the 1950s too? <laughs> The 1890s were bad. That was a bad time. A formal enfranchisement, a formal equal citizenship. Yeah. Um, and the true believers, maybe the architects, are no longer running the show. And yeah. even actually some who are still around um, are sensing the political winds have changed. And I'd yeah. say that happens well before the 1890s. It happens yes. in the 1870s. Yeah. So no, I agree. Like that first generation after, could you talk about the, the sort of next generation before we get to the 1950s, that kind of middle period? Yeah, well, um, so, yeah, so the, you know, uh, Grant was actually, President Grant was very active in, in trying to enforce these laws. But once he was gone, um, then there just wasn't that same political will to enforce, and then we have the compromise in 1876. So, um, that's when the feds stop enforcing these laws. Basically, they pull the troops out of the South. They stop enforcing them. Then you have these uh, supreme, you know, a number of Supreme Court opinions, opinions reading the, uh, interpreting the Re Reconstruction Amendments very narrowly. By the 1890s is when it's really re re entrenched. Jim Crow is really getting entrenched in the Southern states. Uh, amend their constitutions to be, uh, you know, based on race, discriminating based on race. So yeah. Uh, you know, we have then, I have my daughter in the audience who just took AP U.S. history last, last year, who could probably answer this quote. <laughs> we had a lot of conversations about this, but yeah. On that too, yeah. because I'm, I'm interested in maybe in expanding this then to a larger conversation about popular constitutionalism. Sure. Um, I mean, just as a strategy, um, yeah. how effective that is. Uh, obviously, anybody can use it, so, right, so Mississippi, is the first in 1890 to use it in, in terms of, you know, whatever the 15th Amendment says, that's fine, but we're gonna write our own constitution and mm -hmm. have our own meaning attached to that, which ultimately does get upheld by the, by the, by the Supreme Court. But, um, you know, what, what should we make of it as a, as a larger, this is a progressive, it's like a happy story that you tell if you end it in, <laughs> in 1870, but, um, or, and then if you skip up to 1860s or something, but just generally, what is kind of the state of thinking about popular constitutionalism and um, what it looks like, what, you know, what kinds of popular resistance are even available and possible, how you can kind of make your own, um, make it sticky, you know, your own understanding of, of constitutional, just I'd like to hear about that generally. I haven't, I haven't thought about it outside of this context in a while. Yeah, so you're right, of course, here I'm, I'm, I'm Painting the po you know the positive view of it, the positive argument, because uh, the focus is on the anti-slavery constitutionalists and then showing you know the people their legacy. But yeah, it's of course it's it's you you see the po you know the Southern Manifesto in the eight, in the 1950s, the Tea Party activists in the 2010s, right? So this this actually does happen on both sides, of course. And um and 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 the point is really that you can't that that um. Uh, progressives can't just sit on their loyals. You have to keep fighting it. So, you know, that is also true of court uh, rulings. So I was just last week at a conference on Cooper versus Aaron, which is the case where the Supreme Court said, we are the most supreme interpreters of the law, and, and Little Rock, uh, you know, you must desegregate your schools because that's what Brown versus Board of Education said, and State of Arkansas, when you said that you don't have to follow Brown, you were wrong, and we are the Supremes, right? And what happened after that? Little Rock closed down the school. The school board voted and they closed down the schools for a year. They didn't even follow the ruling at all. So I think, what, I guess what I'm trying to challenge, and also I'm coming from a, the standpoint of being a, a law professor, and in, in law schools, um, uh, there's so much focus on courts and litigation and not enough, as, as, as he said, not enough focus on other ways um, that laws are enforced, that it's not enough just to do litigation, that you have to, we have to have these debates, you know, on the ground, you know, uh, political activism, political debates. And, and, um, and that does mean that both sides are gonna be, in, you know, invoking 
these constitutional values. Look at the look at the um, NRA, right? The National Rifle Association and the Second Amendment. That's a great example of popular constitutionalism, of vi being very very effective. Yes. Maybe to follow up on exactly this question, and I realize we're now sort of branching out a bit speculatively here, but yeah, it's um, fine with me. Uh, so, so the NRA was extraordinarily successful in making popular constitutionalist arguments, not just in courts, but in the broader political sphere, in the same way that um, the anti-slavery uh, sort of popular constitutionalist you described it. Uh, meanwhile, uh, groups on the left, like the ACLU, did not branch out yeah. to make popular constitutionalist arguments outside of courts until, like, I don't know, six months ago. <laughs> um, and, I'm, and I'm wondering why, uh, if, if, you've, if you have thoughts on sort of that asymmetry. Yeah. I actually do have some thoughts on that. Um, and uh, you know, Mark Tushin has wrote a great book about that. I can't remember what it's called right now, uh, where he critiques the left for relying too much on the courts. It was because um, that sort of generation of cause lawyers grew up during the time when the Supreme Court was the Warren Court. And it was a court that was enforcing civil rights, and it was an activist court to protect the rights of minorities. And that's what they thought th that courts do, you know? And so, you know, of course, that in the civil rights movement, there was this, there, was, there, there were two, there was N NAACP, which is bringing lawsuits, and then there were, you know, the um, <clears throat> Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the, and the other organizations and Martin Luther King and those other, that were like, we're not gonna waste our time with lawsuits, we're gonna put our boots on the ground, right? But um, yes, I think, I think that is something that happened with the left sort of got uh, complacent about, oh, we, we can just keep filing lawsuits. And, but lawsuits, you know, you need, you need uh, even lawsuits, uh, even when you win lawsuits, you know, you, they, need to, they, they don't really have an effect in, until they're accepted by the wide public, but by the public at large. So Brown doesn't get in, Brown versus Board of Education really didn't get enforced until the late 1960s as a result of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And, uh, and that's 10 years after Brown was decided, of course. Brown being the decision that held that uh, race-based segregation is un, uh, uncons in public education is unconstitutional wasn't until the late 1960s till it was actually enforced, but that was the result of Congress passing legislation that prohibited the discrimination and based in, on race in, um, by uh, recipients of federal funds. And then they passed this huge bill funding education. The, the local districts could apply for f uh, federal funds. And then the, uh, the Justice Department under Lyndon Johnson said, hey, if you're taking our money, you know, you can't discriminate based on race. <laughs> 